So let's get started. What will we cover? Um, I will provide an introduction to taxonomies. We'll take a look at some examples and uh, we'll talk about some definitions. And then we'll talk about some best practices or principles for uh, creating a taxonomy. And then we'll talk about how to start your own project, um, your own taxonomy project. And then because as a taxonomist, we run into common design challenges, I thought it would be nice to uh, share those with you because you'll probably run into at least one of those once you get your project off the ground. So let's get started. I wanted to start with this picture. I took this picture in my neighborhood uh, several weeks ago just because it made me laugh. This is a board that was put up in front of a house under construction and uh, they stenciled post no bills on it. So of course, what did people in my neighborhood do? But they started posting bills. And the first bill I noticed was Bill Gates. He's pretty recognizable. I used to work at the Gates Foundation, so I guess I recognize him anywhere. <laughs> um, but the closer I looked, I, I noticed that there were actually other kinds of bill names on here. Um, I noticed Willy Wonka. So that's no longer a bill. That's a Willy. And then there's Williams and, and Billies and Wills on here. Um, so that was pretty funny, not just uh, people named Bill, but also other kinds of bills, the kind that maybe if you don't pay becomes overdue and you can get into trouble. Um, also a different kind of bill up here, the Bill of Rights, as in a piece of legislation. There was even a dollar bill stuck onto this board. Um, and then one of my favorites here was like the duck bill that a platypus has. So, so many different kinds of bills. There are different kinds, uh, bills being referred to in different ways and then just different kinds of bills. Bills meaning different things to different people. And to me, this, this was a great representation of taxonomy work. Um, this is exactly the kind of challenges we wrestle with as taxonomists. And then I thought about that phrase, post no bills, and thought like, what does that even mean? Like, I mean, it, I know what it means, right? It means don't post any advertisements. But we don't really think of bills as meaning advertisements in this day and age. And so you can see how language has changed because that phrase actually comes from an old piece of legislation. Back in the day, bills meant advertisements and they, they don't really mean that anymore. And so language changing over time is also something that taxonomists wrestle with. So I just loved this community art piece as a great example of what I love about taxonomy work. So you may not realize it, but you actually come into contact with taxonomies quite often. Anytime you're on a website and you're using website navigation, you're actually interacting with a taxonomy. And e-commerce sites have the most fully fledged kinds of taxonomies and navigation structures. So here we're on Etsy and I've selected uh, the home and living uh, main category up here from the navigation. And I can see there are these subcategories, home, bath and beauty, pet supplies. And then under pet supplies, there's even more subcategories, pet collars and leashes and so on. And so this is a taxonomy, right? There are taxonomists at Etsy who have designed this for you to help you navigate through all of the cool products that Etsy offers in order to help you find what you're looking for. And so if I click on pet collars and leashes, say, I'll get a search results page, right? And this looks very familiar to anyone who has uh, spent all their time online shopping, especially in this day and age, right? Um, so you have your search results. And then usually on the left, there's some sort of like filter option. We call these facets often as well. This is all structured data that a taxonomist has designed to allow you to narrow your search results. So here I've selected bearded dragon just because I thought that was the coolest pet type. And I thought how cool would it be to be a taxonomist to develop this list of cool pet types. <laughs> um, but this is just more taxonomy that you uh, actually use probably every day in your, in your daily life. Um, taxonomies also exist in the real world. So when you go to the grocery store, you're actually navigating through a taxonomy too. You know, you know to go to the produce section to find all your fresh fruits and veggies, and you know to go to the canned section to get your canned goods. And you would never expect a fresh tomato to be next to the canned tomatoes, even though they're both tomatoes. So why, why wouldn't you expect that? Well, grocery stores have been designed in a certain way and they've kind of been standardized so that you kind of know no matter what grocery store you go into you have a rough idea of where everything would be and that helps you go through and do your grocery shopping in the most intuitive and fast way possible 
There are other ways that taxonomies are used behind the scenes as well for search and machine learning products. And those get really complicated and, and fun to work with. Um, so just know that they're also helping you behind the scenes to help you find what you're looking for. So there are a lot of different terms, like once you dip your toe in this space, you might encounter all these weird terms. Ontology is kind of a big one right now, knowledge graph. Um, I say things like categories and metadata all the time. The biggest ones I use are probably taxonomies and tags, and you'll hear me use those most today. All of these terms do have uh, technical differences, but they all are all working towards the same goal, and that's to, to provide structure to language to help you find what you're looking for more easily. So don't worry about all the technical differences for it right now. I will be using taxonomies and tags most, and I'll be mostly using those interchangeably. So what is a taxonomy? It really is just a control list of terms, and usually it's controlled by a taxonomist, but not always. And that list of terms provides a standard way of referring to whatever concepts are important to the space that it's operating in. And so why, why is this necessary? Well, as we saw with the bills, there's so many different kinds of bills. Language is messy, right? And, and finding things is hard. I'm sure we've all had experiences where we've struggled to find something. So there are certain goals that a taxonomy has. Uh, the first goal is to control synonyms. So if we can collect all the different ways people, that, people speak about the same concept, we can help everyone find what they're looking for. So sometimes this is a difference of like formal language versus informal language, like refrigerators and fridges. Sometimes it's a spelling difference or orthographic difference, like firefighter with a space or not. Sometimes it's a difference of a dialect or a regional difference, something like elevators and lifts. They're actually referring to the same thing, they're just using different words. And then sometimes it's abbreviations or acronyms. Um, there's a spelled out version and there's an abbreviated version, and that's important to capture as well. The second big thing that taxonomies try to do is to get rid of any sense of ambiguity. So if you have a repository that contains information both about jaguars as an animal and jaguar the car, then you would want to be, make sure that there are two completely separate tags that are clearly labeled so that each user type can find which uh, content they're looking for. Otherwise, you're going to have some pretty angry car enthusiasts when they get like all their results about the animal jaguar. And the third big thing that taxonomies strive to do are define relationships between terms. And so a lot of people will think immediately of hierarchies, and that's one big way that we can define relationships between terms. But there are other, other ways, and, there, um, and, and the, like the categories that we saw in um, the Etsy filters, that's another way that doesn't have hierarchy that is providing some structure and relationship information between terms. So we can say, hey, kangaroos, koalas, and quokkas are all a kind of marsupial. What is a quokka? I'm glad you asked. This little cutie pie is a quokka. <laughs> it's my newfound favorite Australian animal. So what does all this vocabulary and language control get us? Well, what taxonomists are always focused on doing is making sure that you can get all of the relevant results for your query, but also only the relevant results. And that sounds kind of obvious and simple, but it's actually pretty nuanced and complicated once you dig into it. So taking our bill example again, when you're looking for content on bills, if we had a taxonomy for all the bills on that board, we would have something like, hey, did you mean bill the person, bill the money, bill the legislation, so that you could get exactly the right kind of bill that you were after. And then if you picked bill the person, you wouldn't only get results for exact bill, like Bill Gates, but you'd also get all the people named William and Billy and Willie and Will. So that's what, that's what taxonomies are and what they enable, and that's what taxonomists spend a lot of time focused on. So now that we've taken a look at taxonomies and what they are, let's talk about some of the principles that we use when recreating taxonomies. The first one is that a taxonomy must be tailored to your content. So if you take the example of pillows, you might think at first glance, a pillow is a pillow. I should be able to use all the same tags for all pillows to make them findable for my users. When you think about it a little bit more, though, you kind of figure out that there's two main kinds of pillows in the world. There are the kind of pillows that I would want to rely on for a comfortable night's sleep, and then there's the kind of pillows that I definitely would not. <laughs> and so I've kind of split those into bed pillows and decorative pillows. 
And so you can see that there are some tags for decorative pillows here. There are things like shape and cover material. And that makes sense, right? Because for decorative pillows, what you care about is the aesthetic value that it's bringing to your home. And fill material can be important too, because People have allergies and they might need to exclude a certain fill material or just have comfort preferences. So these make sense for decorative pillows. But then when you look at the filters available for bed pillows, we don't see shape and we don't see cover material, right? We kind of understand we're going to put a pillowcase on our bed pillows. So we don't really care what the cover material is and what it looks like so much. But the size matters. Um, also, the shape may not matter as much because bed pillows are you know, more or less all rectangular. So then there are these standard sizes of rectangular that we care about, European or king or queen. And then we see fill again. Well, fill is very important for bed pillows as well. So here you see that the tags are tailored to whether it's a decorative pillow or a bed pillow, but we're also able to reuse tags where it makes sense. So that fill material tags, while they do contain a, a few slight differences, the overarching category is being reused, which is something that taxonomists spend a lot of time on, figuring out where exactly we, can we should tailor to be most specific to the content and where we can intelligently reuse tags in the system for best maintenance and efficiency. The second big principle uh, for taxonomy creation is to only include useful terms. Now this might sound really obvious. Obviously I would only use useful terms uh, in my taxonomy, but you'd be surprised how hard it is to avoid putting in every single concept you can think of. Don't do that. <laughs> um, what do I mean by useful here? I mean that you should really have enough content to support uh, the creation of a tag. And then secondarily, users should actually need to access your content using that tag in that way. So if we look at an example here, um, these are the preparation method tags from the New York Times cooking website. So these are all meant to help people narrow down their set of recipes. Um, at first glance, this is a pretty overwhelming list, right? There's a lot of different preparation methods and it's a little bit hard to scan. Um, when I when I look a little closer, I see uh, I noticed wash, which seemed like a curious preparation method to me. First of all, you kind of have to wash as a first step to most recipes, so that would kind of show up on a lot of recipes, and I'm not sure it would be uh, super helpful in narrowing. Um, but also, how many people really are going to ask? Let me refine my re my recipe results to only those that require me to wash something. It just seemed like a little bit of a bizarre tag to have here. And it would show on a lot of different recipes, so it might not be the best way to narrow. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I noticed shuck. Well, shuck is something that I can only really think of as relevant against oysters and corn, which seems super specific. Do people really need to be able to narrow down their recipes by all the ones that, uh, that make me need to shuck something? Um, it just also struck me as bizarre. So thinking about what are the most useful terms is really important to taxonomy work. What this list looks like to me is actually a really great starting point. It looks like they kind of extracted all the actions from their recipes, which would be a brilliant way to start your, uh, your tagging brainstorm. And then from there, I would wanna think, okay, which ones are too broad? Which ones are too narrow? Which ones maybe can I combine and bundle to narrow down to the right a uh, smaller set of the most useful terms for my users. The third principle is speak your user's language. So the terms need to be labeled in a way that's clear and friendly. Um, and here you need to watch out for things like abbreviations and jargon. So for example, the CIA, for some people that means a government intelligence agency. And for other people, it means a elite culinary institute. So you do need to watch out with things like acronyms and abbreviations and making sure that if you're going to use them as your label, that they're super clear to your audience and they're only, they're only meant in that one way. Um, so again, we have some uh, tags here from the New York Times cooking website. These are the diet tags. Um, and at first glance, I love this list a lot more, right? Like it is much easier to see and look at all of these. There, it's much shorter. It's easier to see what all the options are and they make a lot of sense. I don't have a lot of quibbles with, with a lot of these, except for one, this one, healthy. 
I'm not, I don't know how the New York Times is defining healthy. I have my own definition of healthy. It probably doesn't match your definition of healthy. So if I click this tag healthy and get back a bunch of recipe results, I may be super happy if it happens to fit with my definition, or I might be super confused or unhappy uh, and, un and distrusting uh, if it doesn't match. So if, if your users can't agree on the meaning of a term, try to avoid it. If you can't, if you can't um, exclude it from your list and you really do need to have that concept, uh, figure out how to provide a definition for it somewhere so that you can manage your users' expectations and avoid any angry uh, users who expected something different from their results. So those are the principles. Um, before I move on, I wanted to, to touch on this, that taxonomies often look perfect and they look complete. And that's because the second you put any sort of organization around something, it, it suddenly looks a lot more official and polished. Um, but actually taxonomies are built for a certain purpose. And this means that there are a series of design decisions and trade-offs and compromises that have been made along the way in order to ensure that that taxonomy can deliver its best value. And that means that they're actually not perfect and they're, they're also never done. If you think about how uh, in the bills example, we saw how the word bill has evolved in meaning over time. You know, language changes, use cases change, our content changes, and all of these reasons require us to keep our taxonomies alive and breathing, and we need to go back and iteratively prune and iterate on them all the time. They are never done. So how do you get started with your own taxonomy project? There are three key questions I ask at the beginning of any taxonomy project. The first one's around the users and the use cases. So who are you actually designing for and what are they trying to do? And the second is getting to know your, your content. Um, and the third is getting to know your tool because depending on the tool, you might have different tagging functionality available to you that will in influence how you design your tags. Um, we won't touch, in, touch on the tooling in the slides here, but we'll get into those in the demos, I'm sure. Um, so I think of these three, three things as the three legs to my taxonomy project stool. And really without those three things uh, fully defined and fleshed out, um, you risk having your taxonomy project not, not succeed. So it's worth spending a little time up front thinking about these three key questions. So let's look at users. So who are you designing for? Um, what do users most frequently ask for? And if you're a researcher setting up a research repository, you probably know your users pretty well. They're probably your key stakeholders you interface with every day, right? Uh, what are the terms that they, uh, they use when they, they make research requests of you? Those terms can indicate tags you might need to create for your repository. Um, if you had all your content well organized, what would you be able to do that you're not able to do today? And get specific, you, you know, even writing uh, user stories can be really helpful. So I've sketched out a few examples here. And in green, you'll see uh, the main stakeholder. And then in orange, you'll see some terms that they might use when they make requests of me. Um, and, and those orange terms are uh, ideas for tags that you might need to create for your research repository to allow your stakeholders to find what they're looking for. And then you wanna look at your content. So what is your content? Well. As a researcher creating a repository, this is where you can shine. You know this content super well. You know where it's coming from. You know that it probably has some really important attributes you need to capture. Are there any existing tags? Are they, are they at all useful? Like, Should you reuse them or should you scrap them entirely? It's kind of a big question. Um, and so you can jot down some ideas here. And these are ideas for categories of tags that you might need to create, something like source or audience or topic the methodology you used in creating that piece of research, the market that was being targeted, um, and usually some sort of date uh, filter is really helpful too. And then you get to do what researchers probably do best, which is synthesize all this information. And from there, you can kind of figure out, okay, these are my main buckets or categories that I'm gonna need. And, and these are some ideas for tags under each of those, those categories. And here I've just kind of made these up. Um, but uh, this is exactly what I would go through if I were actually making a uh, research repository tagging scheme. 
So as you get going and creating your first taxonomy project, um, even you're likely to run into some uh, common design challenges. So I've, I've prepared a few scenarios I'd love to run, with, run through with you now. The first one is around whether you should copy someone else's taxonomy. Taxonomists love being super efficient and reusing what's already out there. So we always look for anything that's reusable. Remember when I, when I asked, what, what does your content look like? Are there any tags you can reuse? You do have to ask yourself if it's useful, if it's maybe too old or it just doesn't make sense to use. But if it's useful, then you've already um, gotten ahead in the game. So let's take a look at this scenario. Say you're a user researcher who works really closely with product and marketing, and the marketing team already has a list of personas they've developed for their targeting. Should you just reuse this list that marketing has put together to tag your research for all stakeholders? So say marketing has these, these personas, you know, they like to target millennials and silver surfers and working moms, and this works really well for their marketing targeting. And so if you have your research that aligns to these personas and you have certain research that could use these tags, it might make sense. If this, these are personas that are used across the company and everyone knows what they refer to, then it might make a lot of sense. But if uh, your other stakeholders refer to users in a different way, it probably doesn't make sense. So if product thinks of personas not at all as split between millennials and working moms, but more like uh, professional users and personal users, then uh, you might have some problems here trying to just use the marketing terms. So you have a choice. You either want to use both sets of tags. So say your research could use both marketing persona tags and the product persona tags, or you can opt to go off and create your own tags that's best for your own content. The second uh, scenario to, to mention here is around hierarchy. So we, we talked a little bit about this before, but let's look at the scenario. So say you're a user researcher at a food review company, which has recently expanded into pizzerias. So you have some pizza research that requires tags. So how do you design this pizza tag? So option A is the hierarchy option, right? It's, it's trying to find, um, the right place for the pizza tag, whether it should go under Italian or American, which is actually a pretty big decision and kind of hard to answer, it's not clear. And then option B lays out every tag individually with no hierarchy. So option A, so first of all, you have a kind of a big decision about like whether to put pizza under Italian or American. It depends on what your user mental models are. Not everyone might always think about it in the same way. This is pretty complicated. Um, and, and all your users would have to know which one to pick in order to find your pizza content, right? They would have to know if you put it under Italian that it, to go under Italian first to find your pizza content. Versus option B, where you have uh, all your pizza content tagged with the pizza label and it's available immediately for anyone to find directly without having to think about whether it's under Italian or American or both or, or whatever. Um, so I would recommend option B. Uh, option A is also more difficult from a tooling perspective. So all tools will allow you to do option B, no problem, but not all tools will let you do uh, hierarchies as in option A. So it's, it's safer to uh, design for option B. The truth is most systems don't really need hierarchy until you get to a significant amount of tags, like thousands. Um, and, and at that point, I might be biased, but at that point, it might be wise to uh, get the help of a taxonomist. So always start simple and try doing without hierarchy if possible. The third scenario is around combining concepts. So let's take a look at this one to explain what I mean. Say you're a researcher at a consumer-focused company interested in growing its newer B2B business. How should you tag research on user types? So option A presents tags that I would say are combined concepts, right? They have two different concepts in one single tag. So enterprise power users. And then option B has each one of these concepts, single concept against a single tag. So a little bit simpler structure. Um, so in option A, you might think, okay, well, I have, you know, my research is really about enterprise power users. So I'm going to create that as a new tag and I'm going to put that on my research and I'm done. 
But the problem with option A is that if someone is looking for all enterprise user research, they actually have to choose two very specific different tags, the enterprise power user uh, tag and the enterprise new user research tag, just to retrieve the set of everything that has to do with enterprise users. So this is extra work for your user to do. Versus option B, where we have every tag representing a single concept, that person can retrieve everything about enterprise users just by using that enterprise user tag. And then if they want to narrow down their search, they can use the power user tag in addition to that or the new user tag in addition. People are very used to retrieving a lot of results at first and then filtering down from there. So remember, that's exactly how e-commerce websites work. So we're all very used to this. It's much more natural than trying to combine a bunch of different, um, more precise and narrow concepts in order to get the right set of results to begin with. Option A also is a little bit more maintenance and work for you because you have to create separate tags for all those different combinations you care about. So option B is going to be simpler and a better place to start here. The fourth scenario is whether you need a tag for every concept. So we kind of talked about this with the New York Times preparation methods tags, right? But let's take a look at this scenario. So you're a researcher at a social networking company. Most of your research covers search and profile, but you also have some research on, on inbox and feed. Should every feature get its own tag? So here I have the content breakdown. Say 50% of your research covers search, as a feature and 40% covers profile, and then a much smaller set covers inbox and feed. So option A has us creating a tag for every single one of these features, regardless of how much content we actually have for that tag. And option B does something a little different. It says, okay, 50% of your research has uh, covers search, so let's definitely have a search tag. And profile is also really significant, so let's definitely have a tag for that. But then for this, these other areas that have a lot less content, maybe it's better to have this other tag. And we'll, put, use, we'll use that against uh, any research that isn't around search or profile. The advantage of doing it that way is that you can, you can see what collects under that other category over time. And then once there's a significant amount of content, for something like inbox, you can then add your inbox tag uh, and make sure it's, it, you'll make sure it's useful. Versus option A, which makes all the tags at the get-go, you're not sure it's gonna be useful yet to have that inbox tag and that feed tag. So don't be afraid to either use the closest available tag for your content, if it, even if it doesn't quite fit, it might be good enough, or create a tag that's just like an other bucket and see what collects there over time. This is a perfectly acceptable thing that we do in taxonomy work all the time. And then you can, you can iterate on that other category later and pull out whatever becomes significant. The fifth, the fifth big uh, common dis design challenge uh, is around when to reuse tags. So say you're a user researcher at a company that enables users to create surveys, but then you actually survey your users about your product. Should you reuse that survey tag? So say you've already, you already have a bunch of research that's tagged with survey, but it was meant as the feature because that is something that this company focuses on. And now suddenly you have this new piece of content and you need it to reflect survey as a methodology. Option A says, go for it. It's the same word, just reuse the tag. And option B says, no, 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 watch out. These are different concepts. Survey is being used ambiguously here. We need to actually create two separate tags to make it super clear to users um, which one they're gonna retrieve. And so if you, haven't, <laughs> if you haven't caught on so far, I prefer option B here. <laughs> that seems to be the pattern. Um, because option A is gonna confuse your users, right? Like you're, you're reusing the word survey in an ambiguous way. And so you're breaking the principle of taxonomy work, which is to clarify and get rid of any ambiguity. The person who clicks on survey is gonna get all research about the feature, as well as all research that happens to use that methodology. And that's going to be confusing because that user only wanted one of those. So it's better to use better to create two separate tags. So at some point in your project, someone's going to ask you, or you're going to wonder yourself, how is my taxonomy? Is it any good? Is my tagging correct? 
And there are three ways of kind of assessing that. And it, it goes back to why you created a taxonomy in the first place. So if your stakeholders can find content easily, if your, con if your content is intuitive to tag and multiple different people can do that consistently, and tags exist for most of all your most important concepts, and congratulations, you're in good shape. You can, if you can say yes to all of this, your tagging is, is, is correct. If you find that any one of these is kind of iffy, then that just is indication of um, maybe a little bit more work to do on the tagging. So some advice for the road before we get into questions and demos. Um, start small and simple. It's, you know, this will be easier on you and from a maintenance perspective. Um, it'll also help with making sure people use the tags consistently over time and then plan to iterate and grow over time. So remember, it's easier to add than to delete and it's easier to split than to merge. So if you think about that other category, collecting content over time, it's, it's actually better to uh, see what collects there and then split out what you need to as it grows in importance. And then remember, perfection is overrated. Taxonomies do look perfect, but they never are. So please don't be afraid to create your own. Thank you. Mm -hmm.